Welcome back to Combat Mission Black Sea for a look at the Striker Infantry Battalion. Striker Infantry sits at an interesting place in the US lineup and it really offers a more challenging formation to play with than the Apex Predator, Abrams and Bradley equipped formations. What we're going to do is we're going to take a quick look at the Striker Infantry's history and its purpose, then we're going to examine it from the bottom up. We're going to have a look at the squads, we're going to have a look at the vehicles, or the equipment, or the organisation, and how that impacts on the tactics. The SBCT, or the Striker Brigade Combat Team, actually has a fairly interesting backstory. It doesn't share the same kind of World War II roots as a lot of the other formations. It's a concept that came about as a result of Operation Desert Shield in the First Gulf War and Operation Allied Force in the Balkans. In Desert Shield, once the Iraqis invaded Kuwait, they were hanging around the Saudi-Kuwaiti border, looking like they were just going to carry on and seize the Saudi oil fields as well. So the US needed to very quickly deploy a force to defend that Saudi-Iraqi border. And the only force that they could move in quickly enough was the 82nd Airborne Division. Now this is a light air transportable division, which means it can get there very quickly because it's very light. But the problem is, because it's very light, it lacks the kind of heavy equipment that's going to let it take on heavy enemy armoured or mechanised units like the Iraqis had. It was very widely held at the time and in uh, wargaming, uh, tactical exercises and things afterwards that the 82nd would pretty much have gotten steamrolled if the Iraqis had attacked them. And later on, there's a similar kind of problem crops up in 1999 in the Kosovo conflict. The US are able straight away from their bases and aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean, able to start airstriking the Serbs, but they can't get any ground forces into the area. It was considered too risky to deploy light airborne forces and heavier ground forces. Not only was it going to take them weeks to get into position in the Mediterranean, but there was no chance of getting into the area quickly once they were even on land. Uh, they would have to land in Greece or Albania and then drive into the area of operations in, uh, in Kosovo, which basically means taking a lot of tanks and heavy armoured vehicles through the Carpathian Mountains, uh, which had a very undeveloped road network at the time. And essentially, uh, when you're transporting like 60 ton tanks down a mountain road, you want to make sure that the road is good, otherwise you're going to have serious problems. So they'd have to basically build the road as they went along. So again, the US was looking at a problem where it couldn't get results from the forces that it could deploy quickly, and it was going to struggle to deploy heavier forces as well. Or, to quote the US Chief of Staff, General Eric Shinseki, Our Legacy Army's warfighting prowess is assembled around two force characteristics, heavy and light. Magnificent heavy forces that are well equipped for war but difficult to deploy strategically, and magnificent light forces that can respond rapidly and are well suited for stability and support operations but lack staying power against heavy mechanised forces. So striker equipped units are what the US came up with to fill that gap. The SBCT balances lethality, mobility and survivability against the requirements for rapid strategic deployability. The issue with this is the balancing part. Lethality, mobility and survivability generally involves more weight, bigger guns with bigger ammo, tracks over the wheels, thicker armour, while strategic deployability translates into will fit into the back of a cargo plane and needs as little maintenance as possible, or in other words, less weight. And the result is a light infantry unit mounted in lightly armoured wheeled vehicles. Strategically speaking, it can get to where it needs to be in the world or where it needs to be in theatre very quickly, but the cost of that speed is that while it's more capable than airborne forces, it's still going to have a hard time performing certain tasks against a heavy mechanised enemy. So that's the background behind the SBCT. What do you actually get in Combat Mission Black Sea if you're commanding a striker infantry battalion? The key word here is infantry. The main combat power of the battalion is down in its infantry platoons. Each platoon has a platoon HQ, three rifle squads, a weapons squad and a fire support team and these are all mounted in four infantry carrier strikers. The rifle squad is a very capable infantry unit. Each one has nine men, it's got two M239 saws, two grenadiers with uh, M320 grenade launchers and a marksman with a four times ACOG optic. There are two options in the selection menu. You can swap from the M320s for a M25 counter-death rate target engagement system 
which is a semi-automatic grenade launcher with 25mm airburst and grenades and you can swap the marksman's m4a1 for an m110 marksman rifle which fires a bigger heavier 7.62 millimeter round there are some minor differences with these choices in terms of weapon range and mission carry but practically speaking the effectiveness of the squad is limited by range so yes the uh, m110 can engage out to 800 meters or 300 meters further than the m4s but actually spotting a man-sized target at 800 meters is difficult and hitting one that doesn't want to get shot is even harder in a straight-up infantry fight, US squads are broadly more capable than the Russians or Ukrainians. They have more men, they have more anti-infantry power, significantly better night vision optics and communications equipment, and to boot out of the box in the force selector, they're typically ranging from regular to crack experience, representing US Army veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, and the comparatively highest standard of training you get from a professional military. The issue is that the US infantry squad on its own doesn't have any reliable anti-armour or anti-vehicle weapons. Weapons wise the squad has 40mm HEDP grenades from the Grenadiers or 25mm HEDP grenades if you've got one of the M25s and two 84mm AT4 one-shot disposable anti-tank weapons. That's it. There's two big issues with these uh, anti-tank weapons. First of all, they lack armour penetration to dip into the technical side very very quickly. Both the HEDP grenades and the AT Force used shaped charge warheads. These work by using an explosive charge to push a cone of copper inside out, which makes a concentrated jet of molten metal that burns through armour and does nasty things to the inside of the target. Simply put, the way this works is the bigger the cone is, the bigger the jet, and therefore you get more penetration. The HEDP grenades from the M320s are 40mm, so small cone, not very much penetration. These are actually still very effective against BTRs and BMPs, but they're not going to be reliably knocking them out, especially if the enemy vehicles are shooting back. The AT4 has an 84mm warhead, so it's much more effective than the grenades, and a good hit is going to knock out light armoured vehicles, but they are one shot throw away weapons, so by default the squad gets two shots and they're not guaranteed to hit. Neither of these weapons are going to be very effective against tanks, and both of them can be countered by explosive reactive armour, and both of them are massively outranged by the machine guns and cannons found on the things they're going to be shooting at. And this is the really big US light infantry issue. The infantry on its own lacks anti-armour capability, and it isn't very mobile. These are the issues that the striker was introduced to balance out. So the APC, or Infantry Carrier version of the Striker, carrying the SBCT's infantry tunes is the M1126 Infantry Carrier Vehicle. It's got two crew, a driver and a gunner, a remote controlled weapon system mounting an M2 50 caliber machine gun or a Mark 19 40mm automatic grenade launcher, and then it's got space for 11 passengers. Obviously, catching a ride in a Striker is faster than walking. The Striker going in a straight line on flat ground can do about a thousand meters in a turn in combat mission that's on road or it can do about 650 meters on grass that's a good distance on the average combat mission gap so this gives striker infantry the ability to get into or out of positions much faster than if they're on foot in terms of firepower both the 50 cal and the mark team are very capable weapons with long effective ranges 1800 meters for the m2 and 1400 meters for mark 19 both of them are capable of effectively engaging light vehicles, though the M2 may struggle in head-on engagement for things like BMP2s because of the angle of the BMP's uh, frontal armour. The rounds have a tendency to ricochet off the front. The Mark 19 fires a 40x53mm HEDP grenade, which is bigger than the 40x46mm grenades used in the M320, which makes it a bit more effective at engaging vehicle targets and when you've got the higher rate of fire it can do a lot of damage to the external equipment on tanks so while it's unlikely to knock out something like a t90 if it gets enough hits in it's going to degrade the optics it's going to strip the radios off and the tank's going to be a little bit harder to fight with a big difference between these two weapons is the amount of ammunition carried though obviously 40 millimeter ammo is pretty bulky so the mark 19 striker carries 432 rounds as opposed to about 2,000 rounds for the 50 caliber M2. For the same reasons, you can fit fewer grenades in a belt than you can with 50 caliber rounds, which is important because the remote control weapon system on top doesn't have an auto loader. The gunner or one of the passengers has to open his hatch and reload the weapon manually. 
which could be pretty unhealthy. And obviously, if you're spamming 40 mm grenades everywhere, you're going to be having to do that more often than if you're firing the machine gun. The advantage of the actual mount itself, uh, on top of the usual US advantages of stabilization, excellent optics and things, is that it's a very small target when the striker is in a hold down position. Ideally, the striker wants to be totally out of sight behind a slope or a building with just the remote control weapon system sticking up because things are considered as safer that way. One final note on the striker's firepower is that two of the passengers can stand up in these rear top hatches and keep an eye out. These can and will use their personal weapons, but they're very exposed up there and they're mostly just there to increase the spotting, just to keep an eye out. So next up with the striker, we've got protection. Between the hull and bolt-on armor, the striker is well protected against things like heavy machine gun fire and artillery fragments. On top of this, the infantry carrier M1126s have explosive reactive armor tiles to protect against shaped charge warheads. So an era tile is a block of explosives held in place by two sheets of metal and it works by exploding outwards when it gets hit. So you remember with the shape charge what it does is it makes a jet of molten copper and that's the penetrator. If that hits an explosive reactive armor block what happens is the block blows up and it blows outwards and what that does is it disrupts the jet makes it lose its cohesion and that means it doesn't really penetrate the armor. Against pretty much anything else, 30mm cannons, the 125mm cannons on Russian tanks and the nastier anti-tank missiles out there, the striker is pretty much toast. Realistically in a combined arms environment, the strikers are best off functioning as battle taxis rather than actual combat vehicles because they're not going to survive a direct fight with anything. If the worst does happen and the striker gets caught with its pants down, it can pop smoke and hide. This is thermal smoke, so it will defeat thermal optics. But if you're in a position where you're relying on smoke to keep you safe, then you've probably gone wrong somewhere already. The last and the most important addition that the striker brings to the infantry squad here is extra carrying capacity. Not only does it have thousands of rounds of extra ammunition in the back, along with more HEDP grenades and two more AT4s, but the passengers can pick up an FGM-148 Javelin and three missiles. The Javelin is a fantastic anti-tank weapon and it will reliably destroy any Russian armor out to about 2,500 meters. Not only does the Javelin have a 127 millimeter warhead, so a much larger shaped charge than the 84, but it has a lot of features that make it even more lethal. First of all, it has a top-down attack profile, so Unlike the 40mm HEDP and the 84 which travel in a ballistic arc, the Javelin missile flies up in the air and then it comes straight down on top of the target. Tanks tend to have the thickest armour to the front, not so much on top, so there's less armour to penetrate to begin with and to make it even more effective, all Russian tanks have auto loaders. Essentially this means that below the turret all the ammunition is in a kind of circular carousel and that's for the auto loader which is basically a robot which feeds the gun. That's directly beneath the turret and that's exactly where the molten jet of metal from the shape charge is going to go, which means the tank's not going to have a good day. It also has a tandem warhead to counter explosive reactive armor, so this is very simple. There's a precursor charge at the tip of the missile and that hits and detonates any era blocks in a way that it's not going to interfere with the main charge further back. The Javelin does have some other significant advantages. It's a fire and forget weapon, so the user doesn't have to stay exposed to guided in like wire guided ATVMs. The guidance system doesn't alert the target by firing lasers at it, and it can't be spoofed by Russian Stroller laser dazzlers and things. It's a fantastic anti tank weapon. So that's the infantry squad riding into battle in a striker. Each platoon has three squads in three strikers, then there's a platoon HQ a weapon squad with two M240 MG teams and a fire support team in a final striker. The M240 is a 7.62 uh, general purpose machine gun. The teams can deploy them on tripods and they give us a platform a bit more anti-infantry punch and suppressive fire beyond the range of the infantry squad. And of course the fire support team is basically a forward observer which is a fantastic thing to have down at platoon level. All in all, the Striker Infantry Platoon is best thought of as a light infantry unit on wheels. Obviously, it depends somewhat on the conditions, but broadly speaking, the Strikers are there to get the infantry into a position where they can use their weapons and concealment to effect, and then to get the infantry out of those positions when things go wrong. 
As for the actual infantry, when all three squads pick up their javelins, they're a very serious threat to enemy armour. There's nine missiles overall, and with the high hit probability of the javelin, there's a good chance of knocking out a significant number of enemy vehicles. In anti-infantry terms, the US squad can put an awful lot of fire out, and the platoon's attached fire support team lets them pull in artillery or air support extremely quickly. The main downside is the platoon's fragility. If it gets caught with its pants down or it's fighting on someone else's turn, then it's going to suffer, and it's going to suffer very, very quickly. Avoiding losses with strikers is all about using the terrain to maximum effect, and it's about using the javelins and fire support to deal with threats at arm's length. So that's the striker infantry platoon. There's three platoons in a company, or 27 javelin missiles if you want to look at it that way. Each company has a mortar section that's equipped with two M1129 striker mortar carriers. These are exactly what they say on the tin, exactly the same as the infantry carrier striker, except the passenger compartment has a 120mm mortar crammed into it, and the remote control weapon system has been replaced with a pintle mounted M240. The 120mm fires up and to the rear of the vehicle. It's got 40 high explosive bombs, 6 smoke, and 4 precision guided bombs. Uh, the mortar section HQ rides in a light medium tactical vehicle carrying extra small arms ammunition, which is basically a truck filled with extra ammo. The trucks are there in the table of organization and equipment because it's in the real life table, uh, because trucks are useful. They're not so useful in game at a tactical level when all the infantry is already in transports full of extra ammunition. The last add-on to the company is a Raven drone. This is pretty much a model airplane with a camera on it. It's hand launched and it flies high enough for people not to notice it. In game terms, they can't be targeted by SAMs, but they can be shot down by AA fire. Plus, you'll lose the drone if the pixel truck and operator using it gets killed. The Raven is a pretty big deal, especially for such a fragile formation as a striker company, because it allows you to get eyes on somewhere you would otherwise have to expose part of your force to observe. That way you can get early warning, you can observe a flank, you can keep tabs on the enemy, and best of all, you can use it with a forward observer or these fire support teams that are just crammed into the unit to call artillery in. So it's an extremely handy piece of kit. Finally, the company is led by a company HQ. This is the company commander and his XO, who both have M1126 strikers, sadly without the javelins inside. Yet another fire support team, this time in a dedicated fire support vehicle, which is a M1131 striker fire support vehicle, or basically a normal striker but it's got more optics and better communications and a pintle mounted 50 so without the remote control and this is designed specifically as a forward observer vehicle so it's very very quick at calling fire missions in and finally the company HQ also has a sniper team attached and they ride around in a Humvee. The sniper team has two marksmen and a backup guy with a M4 with an M320. One of the marksmen has a 7.62 M1110, same as the option for the infantry squad. And the other one has a choice between the M107A1 50 caliber anti-material rifle and the Mark 21 precision rifle in either 7.62 NATO, 0.300 Winchester Magnum and 0.338 Lapua Magnum. In practical combat mission turns, the three cartridges for the Mark 21 are pretty much interchangeable. The 50 caliber of the M107A1 can damage light vehicles but don't expect it to do anything significant. Realistically, uh, they're in the same boat as the infantry. The chances of spotting and killing a target that doesn't want to get shot at long ranges is pretty slim, and the sniper is probably better off in um, an observer role. And that's the Striker Infantry Company. Each battalion has three of them. That's 81 javelins, if we're keeping count, and then it's got a headquarters company attached as well. The headquarters company is pretty much where all kinds of specialist stuff has just been crammed in. It's got a sniper section, then a scout, mobile gun system and mortar platoons along with another Raven drone. The sniper section is just two sniper teams in a Humvee, like we talked about a minute ago. The scout platoon is a very lightly equipped infantry platoon. Three squads of five men armed with M4s plus a grenade launcher and the platoon HQ. They're all mounted in... M1127 striker reconnaissance vehicles and these are pretty much the same as the FO striker in that they have more better optics and communications and they have a manually operated pintle mount for the main weapon instead of remote control weapon system. They don't have any javelins stowed away, just extra small arms, ammo and few AT4s. 
The big difference between these guys and the normal infantry squads is that they have more thermal optics, so they're a bit better at spotting things. But ideally, they shouldn't be fighting. They really don't have the kind of firepower to really get stuck in like the infantry does. The mobile gun system platoon consists of M1128 mobile gun system strikers. These are strikers that have no passenger carrying capability, instead they have a 105mm gun mounted in a remote control turret at the back. These are primarily fire support weapons, so it carries mostly high explosive rounds. It does have some armor piercing fin stabilized discarding sabot rounds and heat rounds. So it can be used in an anti-tank realm, but it won't reliably penetrate the frontal armor of things like the T-90, and it's definitely not going to survive getting hit in return. It also doesn't have a lot of ammunition. It only carries about 20 rounds, so it's not fantastic in prolonged engagement, but it is pretty nippy. Uh, because the turret is remote controlled, it can stay hull down with only that turret exposed, so the crew are going to tend to survive if it gets hit. And it does have a coax M240 and a pintle mounted 50 cal for some suppression work. Overall with these things, they are useful, they do fill a role, but it's best to remember that they're not tanks. And they should really be handled like any other striker, i.e. very, very carefully. Finally, the mortar platoon consists of two mortar sections identical to those in the rifle companies and a HQ element which is in Humvees. And just like the other mortar sections, you can choose these as off map instead of on map. So that's it for the HQ company. The entire battalion is commanded by a HQ team backed up by an operations team and a tactical air control party or TACP in M1130 command vehicle strikers which, once again, are basically the same as the infantry carrier striker except they've got more aerials and things on they've got more communications gear so there we go that's the striker infantry battalion in the quick battle the entire battalion will set you back around about 20,000 points and 1500 rarity depending on all the soft factors and what weapons choices you're making that's enough to fit into a huge scale meeting engagement uh, down at the more reasonable kind of gameplay scale a medium sized meaty engagement with a limit of about eight and a half thousand points is more along the lines of a reinforced company. A company costs about five thousand, and then there's a 419 rarity for the, uh, the Raven drone. And with the company, you've got a very compact but capable formation, and the remaining three thousand odd points you've got, you can be spending on uh, important things like target reference points, artillery, air support, uh, all kinds of little add-ons and things to round the formation out, depending on what map you're playing on. So there we go. Hope you guys found that interesting. This guide is going hand in hand with the eight wheeled handicap, which is a almost live turn by turn multiplayer game uh, where I'm going to be playing with the striker infantry against a German G's uh, full-on Russian combined arms force. So uh, that's looked forward to in the very near future. Like I say, hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was uh, useful to you guys and I'll catch you in the next video.